Good morning, church. My name is Raekwon Harrison. So excited to be with you this Sunday. Man, I miss you guys a ton. Uh, 2020 has been such a brutal year, such a crazy year, so much just uncertainty, uh, so much conflict. But it is a day still that we can rejoice in our God, rejoice in Jesus, that he is alive, he is well, that he is with us, for us. I want to read a scripture in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28. A little different. It's going to be in the message version. It says, don't you see what we've got? An unshakable kingdom. And do you see how thank don't you see how thankful we must be? Not only thankful, but brimming with worship, deeply reverent before God. For God is not an indifferent bystander. He is actively cleaning house, torching all that needs to burn, and he won't quit until all is cleansed. God himself is fire. You know, church, for me, this series that we've been diving into, uh, Kingdom Come, has really been refreshing, especially with everything going on this year. It's really been exposing and helping me to like really get into, hey, where's my confidence? Where's my hope? Where are my expectations? And it's just a great reminder that our God has a great kingdom for us and that it's unshakable. I love in this passage where it says we should be brimming with worship to the point of overflowing. You think about a cup that's overflowing or being consumed with something. Uh, we should be overflowing in that way with our reverence towards God, with what he's done for us. The fact that he's given us Jesus, that he's died and resurrected for us so that we can have that relationship with him again so that we can have this kingdom that he's promised. And that really gives me a lot of joy, gives me a lot of hope um, because of the one that promised it, because of the one that said, hey, I'm gonna do this, and God does not fail. So church, this morning, I hope that the word inspires you, that it encourages you to go deeper with Jesus, and that uh, you can be refreshed by him. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord, for just being able to be with you, God, this Sunday. Uh, thank you so much for your word and for Jesus, this promise that you've given us, God, this unshakable kingdom. I pray, God, that as we worship you, as we come to you, God, that you can help our hearts, uh, God, to be engaged. God, help us to uh, grow in our faith, God, grow in our joy. Uh, Jesus has great plans for us. God, help us to be rooted in that, rooted in his promise. I know this year has been crazy, but you're not an indifferent bystander. You're actively moving, actively cleaning house, and you love us so much. So we thank you, Father, for this service. Be with the word as it's preached, and uh, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. It's great to be together. I hope you're doing well today. And uh, it's time in our service where we focus our hearts on contribution. Talking about money right now is pretty difficult, especially with the holiday season just right around the corner. And, uh, you know, for Miranda and I, this is our first holiday as a married couple. And so the list of people you give presents to and the families you have to visit and the people that you think about just like almost triples than when you're single. And so Miranda and I just sat down and tried to plan for the holidays and tried to budget and see who we should get gifts to and what's the best way to make it fit our budget but also be generous and make people feel loved. Uh, but also we want to decorate for Christmas because we just got married this year. We don't have anything to decorate with. So we have to buy Christmas decoration. And uh, for me as a finance guy, it can be difficult. It can be hard if, if you're the finance guy in your family and if you're not ready for the holiday, you can be looking at your finances and just pulling your hair out and probably looking for other places to recoup the costs. And you might be thinking it could come from your church contribution but there's something about holidays that we usually miss out or forget about. Holidays for the church and for its people has always represented key moments in the life of the people. And that is reflecting on the unfolding gospel of Christ through the redemptive history. If you look at holidays from Old Testament festivals to the, uh, to the New Testament Christianization festivals, like the Passover, Pentecost, for example, these holy days prompted believers to remember God's faithfulness to His people. And why do we celebrate God's faithfulness to people of the past? It's because His past faithfulness is also future bent. If you look with me uh, in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 15, which says, Remember His covenant forever, the word which He commanded to a thousand generations. The same God who kept his word to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the people of Israel keeps his promises today to those who are in Christ. And that means us as well. 
So during this holiday, as you celebrate God's faithfulness to His promises to you and all that He's done in your life, do not forget or put aside the financial promises you've made to God as well. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, I am extremely grateful for your sovereignty, for your faithfulness to me personally throughout the years. God, help us uh, during this holiday season to remember your faithfulness, to remember what you're about and how uh, the this, this story of the unfolding gospel uh, of, of, of your kingdom in our hearts. And as, as we uh, remember, as we celebrate uh, just different holidays this season, that we can remember also our promises made to you, our faithfulness made to you. And, and I really pray that we can come through this season, that we can remember uh, you during our celebrations. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Worship with us this morning. Lift your hands if you feel like it. But just know that God is awesome. My God is awesome. He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. I need Church, let's say that again. My God, He's moved. Keeps me in the valley. I, I, my God is all about He heals and strength where forever He will reign. your voice and say how
Good morning, everyone. It is great to be with you this morning. Uh, it has been a little bit since I've been able to give the Sunday sermon. And on one hand, I'm grateful that the staff was able to give me some time after our son was born. Um, but on the other hand, I'm excited uh, to share with you what I've prepared for you today. As you can see, I'm not in my living room, uh, which is where I normally record sermons. I'm in our church building right now, which I got to say, I'm pretty I'm pretty creeped out right now. There's just noises going on in here. I don't think anybody's here. Um, I could be wrong, but uh, it is kind of freaky being here alone, but I figured this would be a little less distracting uh, than a crying baby or, you know, and we're getting used to that whole scene there. Anyways, it is great to be with you guys. Uh, I hope you're able to tune in with family, connect with people. Maybe you're in a small group right now, whatever it may be. Um, I am grateful to be able to share with you guys what I have prepared today as we continue our Kingdom Come series. And I want to say hi to the Desert Cities. I want to say hi to my Riverside family. Hi to Rancho, everybody tuning in um, from all over Inland Empire. If you're not from any of those areas, hey, I'm glad you found us and you stumbled upon uh, this uh, Sunday service link. We had a baby. Two months ago, Maverick Mateo Newman was born. And I got to be honest, uh, I had a lot of expectations for how the whole process was going to go down. Now, I know what a lot of you are probably thinking right now, Sam, why did you have expectations? You, you didn't even do anything. And you're totally right in thinking that. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I had expectations of how things were going to go down. Full transparency, I'm just being honest. This should be a safe place, right? I can be real with you guys. Uh, I had some, some expectations of how the whole process of my son coming into this world was going to go down. And none of them were met. I mean, from the beginning to the end, everything I expected, the way I expected things to happen, how I want him to be, none of it happened, but I wouldn't have changed a thing. But still, when expectations aren't met, when we have failed expectations as human beings, it's not the easiest thing. For example, in my mind, how, how this process was going to start is sometime around midday, preferably not before noon. I would like to get things in order of my day and week and stuff. It'd be nice if the process had started afternoon, but I could do a 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. appointment, if that's what you want to call it, for, for Sylvia to start labor. That would have been nice. I would have totally been prepared for that, but that's not what happened. I mean, we're talking 3 a.m., I wake up, Sylvia says, hey, we need to go to the hospital. And I'm like half asleep trying to wake up, find the wall so I can throw some water on my face in the bathroom. And, and I'm not good without sleep. I'm not very um, coherent, awake, alive, I guess you could say. I'm not, I don't work well with no sleep or interrupted sleep. And so I, I probably said some dumb things or responded poorly to Sylvia in that time. And uh, it's just not how I expected things were going to go. So 3 a.m., we are moving. We're getting to the hospital. And uh, again, in my mind, my expectation is we're going to be able to show up to the hospital. The sliding glass doors would open. We'd be welcomed with open arms by happy nurses and administrators. And it was going to be great, right? That's not what happened at all. Uh, due to COVID, I couldn't even go inside the hospital until Sylvia was completely admitted in there. So I actually had to drop my in-labor wife off at the front of the labor and delivery center. And she had to walk up to the, to the front desk, walk up some stairs by herself in labor. And I had to sit in the parking lot and wait for a phone call from her saying, hey, you can come up now. And so I sat in the parking lot for about 25, 30 minutes with all our bags just waiting, waiting to be told I can come into the hospital and be with my wife. I thought that I was going to have all this time in the room to, to set it up for Sylvia and make it look nice. I, I was trying to be a good partner, a good husband, and I researched all this stuff that make it nice and comfortable for women. I got a speaker for music. I had twinkle lights to kind of just make it nice and peaceful in there, feel less like a hospital. Um, I had a fan to, to cool her down if it got too hot. 
Um, there was time for none of that. I mean, we got in the room and the baby was coming now. And so everything I had planned, everything I, I thought was gonna make me a good birthing partner, didn't have time for any of that stuff. And, and lastly, I thought, man, when my son comes out, I'm gonna have this heartfelt bonding moment with my child. I'm gonna hold him, maybe he'll open his eyes for the first time, give me a little giggle just to show he, that's my dad, you know, and it would be this great moment. And but not again not what happened at all i didn't even know where to stand in the hospital room next thing i know a baby's in my arm and the nurses want me to put the diaper on i've never put a diaper on a baby and i couldn't figure that out want to make sure sylvia's okay and and none of my expectations were met that day again fully aware i shouldn't have had that many expectations but again being honest with you guys uh, the title of my sermon today is, I did not expect it to look like this. This is not what I expected. And, uh, you know, I think as human beings, we all respond to failed expectations differently. Uh, some of us, we, we, when our expectations are met, we stress. Maybe get really anxious and, and paranoid and kind of freak out of what does this mean and what is the future going to hold and how can I trust and, and what am it, what's it going to be like now because I had this idea of how things were supposed to go and we, 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 we get really anxious when expectations aren't met. Uh, some of us, we get defensive when expectations aren't met. We stand our ground. We refuse to let go of perspective or opinion. Uh, we demand uh, that our way, our expectations be met, especially when they're failed. Some of us get hurt uh, when expectations are, are failed to be met. Uh, we feel pain. We feel let down. We feel like we can't trust. We feel unsafe. Uh, we could feel hurt when our expectations are failed. And lastly, I think we can get frustrated when our expectations aren't met. We can feel like uh, an injustice has been done to us when my expectations, my way of thinking, how I pictured things being and going didn't happen, and it can be incredibly frustrating. You know, today, I want to analyze what might have been the disciples' expectation of how the kingdom was going to come. But ultimately, what they got was totally different and totally not what they were expecting. And my goal in doing this is to get you asking yourself the question, do my expectations of how the kingdom is supposed to be and look and, and what it's like to be in the kingdom of God, do those expectations match God's? Or if you want to get a little deeper, maybe a deeper question I want to get people asking themselves or thinking about in our time here today is whose kingdom is my energy, faith, and focus moving towards? God's? God's kingdom? Or my own kingdom? I'm going to go ahead and say a word of prayer, and then I want to jump into what I've got prepared for you guys today. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time. I, I am just still getting used to talking to a camera and I'm standing alone in this giant church building that's kind of creepy. Uh, but God, nonetheless, I'm here because I want to guide people to worship you. I pray that those who are watching, uh, who are diving into the scriptures, maybe singing at home, uh, can also be led to worshiping you this morning. God, lead me as I guide us in talking about the kingdom um, and how expectations don't always meet, meet with your reality. But God, we want to do your will and lead us to that here today. God, we love you. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. You know, it was prophesied for, for generations and generations that this Messiah would come and that he was going to, to establish this great nation, the kingdom of Israel, right, was going to be established. The Messiah was going to free them from oppressors and, and just lift up this kingdom. And so for, for Jews in biblical times, there was this expectation and this faith and this hope that when the Messiah comes, we'll be put back up on top. Right, we'll be freed uh, from society's grasps and different nations and, and all this stuff going on around us. But the Messiah is going to free us from captivity and lift us up. 
And so from the very beginning of the disciples calling, I believe that they had some expectations of how this kingdom was going to come into place. In Matthew 4, verse 19, we, we see Jesus is calling his first disciples here. He says, come and follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Now, I fully believe that when Jesus was calling uh, his disciples, there was inspiration in, 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 that motivated them. They were inspired by Jesus, that this rabbi, this great teacher, uh, was calling them to be his disciples. Big deal. And, and we're not going to get into all that today, but culturally, that was an honor. That was a privilege. And them dropping their nets really wasn't as a big deal as we may think it was. It was actually a really exciting, empowering thing. But I can't help but wonder if in that moment when Jesus called them, if, if they maybe started to create some expectations of the kingdom coming. Because again, they, they knew that this Messiah was going to come and establish the nation of Israel. It was going to lift them up uh, and, and free them from, from the nations that have oppressed them and, and, and kept them down for years, uh, centuries and and. and it was going to glorify God and God's people would finally be back on top. And so Jesus' disciples had to know about that. They had, that was in their culture, it was in their history. It's what they grew up hearing and believing in. And so when we see Jesus calling his disciples here, sure, I think they were inspired to be disciples and followers and, and what an honor to learn from such a great teacher. But I think they knew there was something different about this guy. Like, could this be the guy? And if he's the guy... And is this the time? Is this the time where the kingdom is going to be established? And, and are we going to get to be a part of it? That would be incredible. And are we going to get to see this guy lead us to overthrow? Are we going to get to be a part of this? Is this our chance to socially climb and be greater? And oh man, this is, this is incredible. And, and so I wonder if expectation in the disciples' minds started to arise of how this kingdom was going to come. And in their mind, I think they believed it was a physical kingdom that was going to rise up from the ashes and Jesus was going to lead the way and they were going to get to be a part of it. And so I think from the very beginning, expectation of what it was going to be like started to arise in these disciples' minds. And you fast forward through three years of Jesus' ministry. So, so many moments of teaching, of healing, of miracles, of incredible moments. And we come towards the end, right before the crucifixion, to the betrayal of Jesus. And I want us to read here together uh, what happens. In John 18, and I'm going to start in verse 3. Read along with me. It says, So Judas came to the garden, guiding a, de a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? I mean, think about the setting of this moment. For three years, these men have been walking, learning, just witnessing Jesus do so many incredible things, maybe with the expectation of this is the guy that is going to lead the, the nation of Israel to be restored. We're going to get to be a part of this kingdom coming, and, and maybe we'll get to ride along with Jesus and, and rise to the top, whatever expectations they might have created. And then they fall into this moment where what seems like an army of people is coming to arrest one man. And, and Jesus is standing there going, who have you come for? And they tell him they're, they're looking for him. They say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he goes, I am he. And what a cool moment that I just kind of a picture, kind of an Avengers type scene here where he says, I am he. And this just whoosh of wind flushes out and all the soldiers and Pharisees and chief priests get knocked to their knees. And what an epic 
moment. And then he asks him again, who are you here for? I mean, what a beast. I did. I just get hyped thinking about it, right? And, and again, they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am the one you're looking for. Let these men go. And, and you got to remember, Peter and all the other disciples are witnessing this. They just saw that Jesus said, I am he. And then all these men got shot to the ground. And so in Peter's mind, I wonder if he's thinking, man, this is it. This is what we've been waiting for. Jesus is going to establish the kingdom right now. And so Peter gets fired up and he draws his sword out and he cuts some dude's ear off. And he's probably going, this is it. It's about to go down. These guys don't even know what they're in for. And, and then Jesus goes, what do you put your sword away? That's, that's, I've got to drink the cup my father handed to me. And so again, you see probably some expectation of what the kingdom is supposed to be like fueled up in Peter's head and he acted on it. And no, that's not it. That's not the kingdom. That's not how things are going to be done. And Jesus, put your sword away. This is, this is not what it's going to be like. You know, it brings a lot of light to how confused the disciples must have felt after witnessing this man die. This man who they thought was going to lead them to be a part of this historic establishment of the kingdom. They just watched him die. And so all that expectation, that, that hype and what things were going to be like and how it was going to go down. And we were going to get to ride with Jesus to the top and see him conquer and, and free people and establish this great kingdom. But, but, he's, but he's dead. So how is a physical kingdom going to be brought here how is the kingdom going to come if jesus died man none of my expectations are going to be met but then jesus resurrects and these guys are excited they're besides himself i mean thomas had to see it but but he ended up believing and again i bet these guys got in the mind frame of man this has to be the guy this has to be the time where the kingdom comes and we rise to the top again probably fueled with expectation but we read in the scriptures that even though jesus physically raised from the dead some still doubted right maybe some of that doubt was because their expectations of what the messiah was supposed to be and their expectations of how the messiah was supposed to supposed to bring forth the kingdom those expectations hadn't been met and so they're probably thinking, okay, Jesus, you're back, you're resurrected, this is cool, but where is the restoration of Israel? Our great nation, where is our new social status? Where is this kingdom, our moment in history that, that we were supposed to ride in with you in? And where is our expectations of how this was all supposed to be? Even in Acts 1, verse 6, they asked Jesus straight up, it says, they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus kind of says, hey, it's not up for you to know. And then something else happens. Jesus, this probably really confused them. Jesus leaves. He tells them, hey, go, go teach people to be my followers. Tell them how to follow me. Baptize them. I'm going to be with you. I got to go. And he and he leaves, and that was probably extremely confusing. So you look at all this. You look at from the, the first calling, the expectation build of, man, we're going to get to be a part of something great. The kingdom is coming. Jesus is doing miracles. And along the way, through the three years of Jesus' ministry, the disciples are probably getting more and more excited of the reality. The kingdom is coming, and this man's going to lead us there. It's going to look great. Maybe we'll have to fight, fight some battles. We'll have to, to, to destroy some people, but we'll get to be a part of it. It's going to be incredible when we got Jesus. And then the moment happens where Jesus says, I am he, and wipes all these people to the ground. Peter gets excited. This is it. And Jesus goes, no, it's not. Calm down. And then Jesus resurrects, and maybe this is the time, maybe this is going to be it. Jesus says, hey, teach people, make disciples, and then he leaves. I mean, how confused would you be? <laughs> so many failed expectations in this, this storyline here, in all these situations, and I would be complete and utterly confused. Like, where is the kingdom, and when is it coming into place, and how, how are we a part of it? You know, in Acts 2, 
we see all the disciples together, and I'm sure they were feeling all of that. Like, what in the world are we doing? Because everything we thought was going to happen has not happened. So where do we go from here? And they probably were trying to figure out, what is Jesus talking about? Make disciples? What about Israel? What about our kingdom? Where, where is that coming to play? And, and they were probably freaking out, not knowing how everything was going to happen. And then something did happen that made everything click. In Acts 2, we, we read how the disciples were all together in this room. And, the, and then this violent wind erupts inside the house. And it says that tongues of fire rested on each of them. And I, I don't know if that means something else that I'm not picking up, but I'm picturing a literal tongue of fire resting on each of the disciples. And it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit just like Jesus promised them that the Spirit was going to come and help them. Next thing you know, Jesus, sorry, Peter starts preaching. He starts preaching the word. Now, I know there's a lot of it's bitty pieces that you can dive into there, and I'm skipping a lot, but I'm trying to give you the full picture here. We just see Peter preaching. There's something different about Peter, though. You're able to see a shift in Peter's thinking. He's no longer consumed with with being first. He's no longer consumed with this idea of this physical kingdom coming and being a part of it. He's preaching about the reality that Jesus was here to live a life that showed us how to enter the kingdom of God. It all clicked to him. And I believe in this moment when the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, everything clicked. I imagine them going back moment by moment, every single moment they spent with Jesus, connecting all the dots. I wonder if the Sermon on the Mount just made 100% more sense to them at that time, right? They remember Jesus standing up to the religious leaders, uh, the times he took care of people nobody else was willing to take care of, the times he rescued people under the scrutiny of pious structures and men, and, and they just started connecting all the dots of, wow, the kingdom is not what we expected. It was never about their ideas or their values or their, their expectations. But Jesus was showing us what it looked like to belong to the kingdom of God the entire time. It must have been the, the biggest light bulb moment in the history of mankind, right? Where they finally realized that, hey, it was never about physically establishing this kingdom, being this great nation of structures and, and systems. And no, Jesus was showing them the kingdom of God, what it looked like to be in the kingdom of God the entire time he was with them. What an incredible moment it must have been for them. I mean, you see in Peter's preaching in Acts 2 that it had to be a light bulb moment from the Holy Spirit because we all know Peter was having some trouble getting things, his time with Jesus and, and being a little prideful and speaking too much. But Peter, Peter was able to connect the dots and it all made sense to him that the kingdom is totally not what he expected. You know, similar to the, the journey the disciples went on that I just illustrate, you know, I think we're all susceptible to creating different expectations for what life as a Christian or life in the kingdom of God is supposed to look like. Whether it's from personal opinions, eternal, internal des desires, misunderstandings of how God's work, or just ignorance towards the context of the scriptures, we too can create false ideas, false pictures, narratives of how things are supposed to be as members of of the kingdom of God, right? We, we can start to have ideas like, I'm supposed to be treated this way. I'm supposed to be able to do certain things. I'm supposed to be able to decide the church is going in this direction. I'm entitled to my feelings. And we can, we can start to develop almost our own understanding, our own theology of God's kingdom. And I, th I believe this leads to maybe giant letdown, <laughs> critical hearts, and maybe even a theology that places us at the center of God's being rather than God at the center of our being. You know, just like the disciples had a bunch of ideas and expectations of how this kingdom was, was going to come, I think we're all susceptible to creating different ideas 
or, or perceptions or expectations of what life as a Christian or life as a member of the kingdom of God is supposed to look like. And we develop these expectations maybe from our own opinions or misunderstandings of how God works or just ignorance towards the scriptures. We, we can all create a false understanding of what life is supposed to be like in the kingdom of God. Right? We, I, I've been there where my expectations aren't met in the kingdom, and, and so I blame it on people. I become critical of people. I become critical of the church as a whole, and, and I just think, well, this is clearly not of God because it failed my expectations. This can't be a part of the kingdom of God because it's not how I view things. And I think we can all go there pretty easily. You know, I look at at that, that connected dot moments in, that I believe the disciples had in Acts 2 when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And I wonder if they remember when Jesus taught them to pray in Luke 11, right? It says in Luke 11, verse 2, this is how Jesus taught them to pray. When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us of our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not in to temptation. You know, maybe they made this connection going, wow, Jesus wanted us to pray for God's kingdom to come here. He wanted us to pray for his will to be done here, just like it is in heaven, that there was this collaboration that Jesus was trying to get the disciples to have, like, hey, God's kingdom needs to come here. God's kingdom is all about his will. And I wonder if in that moment, as they were remembering, they were connecting the dots to Jesus teaching them to pray in Luke 11, that they realized, man, this kingdom that Jesus came to establish, it, it is not earthly. Its boundaries aren't confined by politics and social status, by our expectations or our opinions or any other man-made force. The kingdom is eternal and its values, ideas, and laws, and our expectations, it should be completely centered around God's will. But again, when we're led by our expectation, our perception of how things should be, how the kingdom should be, our opinions, our feelings, we, we, can, we can sort of change this prayer. We can sort of change how we talk to God and think of God, of how things should be. It can become, God, I love you. Now my kingdom come. Here's my will. Let it be done. Give me what I want and give me what I need and forgive me as I think about forgiving other people. Oh, and let me feel saved while I live my life. And obviously we don't deliberately say this, but we can totally go to this kind of thinking when we're relying on our expectations of how the kingdom of God are supposed to reign, is supposed to reign true, rather than letting what God says the kingdom of God is reign true in our hearts. And what happens when our expectations aren't met? Again, we get, we get critical. We want to walk away. We want to give up, whether it's on our family uh, in the church, whether it's on serving God according to the truth, our expectations can lead us so far away from what it actually is supposed to be. All right, church, so this is how I want to close out our time here today. I want to ask some, some like self-reflection questions here, and hopefully you can engage in a conversation with your friends, your family, your spouse, your roommates, whoever you're with right now, uh, to be able to talk about this a little further. Um, but here's the first question that I want you guys to talk about is, how has failed expectations in the kingdom affected your faith in God? And my second question is, as, as we aim to build God's kingdom and be focused on his will, I want you to ask yourself this question, is my life set up to build God's kingdom or build my own kingdom? So I want to encourage you guys, have some time here to, to talk, pray together, but where, see where your expectations lie into life as a Christian, being in God's kingdom uh, versus uh, what it actually is and what is range true in scriptures through God's word. I'm going to go ahead and say a word of prayer, and that'll conclude our time here today. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time uh, that we're able to worship together despite the uh, barriers going on with COVID. I do want to take this time to pray for uh, just the people in our communities, be it in our church, our neighborhoods, our family who have been uh, infected with COVID. I know it is a very scary time. I want to pray for those who are currently 
uh, under symptoms right now or feeling it, get, you be with them and that they re can recover um, uh, from this sickness, God. Um, but God, as we talk about your kingdom coming, uh, I know that th there can be so many expectations created of what life as a Christian, what, it's, what it should be like to be in the kingdom of God. And, and when those expectations are failed, God, they, they can affect our faith in you, our relationship with you. Um, I'm sure the disciples had this crazy idea of what it was going to be like and how things were going to go. And they were totally met with a different idea um, and a different plan than what they, they expected it to be, God. And uh, But filled with the Spirit, they were guided towards your will. God, I pray in the same way during this time that we can be guided towards your will. God, towards building your kingdom and not letting our expectations and, and the failure of those expectations be what drives us away from you, what disconnects us from you, what divides us from our brothers and sisters. Uh, but we can be consumed with your will, with your kingdom being established here on earth uh, that is completely revolved around your ideas, your values, and your laws, just like the life Jesus lived here on earth. God, I pray we can study Jesus uh, we can live him out. We can, we can follow in his footsteps as he is the best example of what it looks like to be in your kingdom and way better than any expectations or, or, or false understandings that we can create in our own. God, we love you so much. Thank you for this time. It's your son's name I pray. Amen. Have a great Sunday.
Thank you so much, Sam, for a great sermon this morning. It's always great to hear from you. I hope everybody at home enjoyed it and that everybody is getting ready for Thanksgiving with their families. Please be safe out there uh, with COVID uh, spreading right now the way it is. Please take care of yourselves and uh, make sure you're social distancing, washing your hands, and uh, cleaning all surfaces. I do want to remind everybody uh, that we have our annual toy drive coming up this Saturday, November 28th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Rancho building. And at the same time, we're gonna be having a blood drive going on. Uh, so those of you that do wanna register for uh, the blood drive, make sure that you talk to Caroline Johnson uh, in Rancho Cucamonga. Again, toy drive is this Saturday, November 28th, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, please bring one unwrapped toy for each member of your family. Love you guys a lot. See you next weekend. Mm -hmm. Dum ba ba dum ba dum 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 ba ba dum ba dum 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 ba ba dum ba dum thanks to the Lord for He is good. He is love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. He is love. Him who among us does great wonder. He is love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of God. He is love endures forever. Give thanks, Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Sing praise to his name for his promises are good. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Sing praise to his name, his love reigns forevermore. Dum, 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 ba, ba, dum, ba, dum, 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 ba, ba, dum, ba. To him who calls us from our sorrow. He is love endures forever. Freed us from our enemies. He is love endures forever. Who by his wisdom made the heavens. He is love endures forever. And spread the earth upon the sea. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Sing praise to his name for his promises are good. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Sing praise to his name, his love reigns forevermore. Dum, 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 ba, ba,
To him who calls us his disciples His love endures forever Who sent his son to die on a tree His love endures forever Him who came low to call us higher His love endures forever And by his truth has set us free His love endures forever Give thanks, give thanks to the Lord For his love endures forever Sing praise to his name For his promises are good Give thanks to the Lord For his love endures forever Sing praise to his name His love reigns forevermore Give thanks to the Lord his love endures forever. Sing praise, Sing praise to his name, for his promises are good. Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. Sing praise to his name, his love reigns forever.